All right, listeners. Well, welcome to the Q podcast for this week. We have a very, very special guest. I'm uh, happy to have him in here. I'm actually uh, writing a story about one of uh, uh, one of the things he he does here in Central Illinois. He is a um, really a, a consulting chef with Zion Coffee Shop, Coffee Bar. He uh, set up their menu there. Uh, he also runs his own local business, um, baking breads. If you've been down at the Pure Riverfront Market, you might have bought bread off of them. Uh, this is Cody Scoggin. How's right. it going, Cody? Very good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. So I, I guess if we wanted to start out with um, what, I, I, you know, you, you started out in the central Illinois area. Yes. That's where kind of the, uh, your journey as a chef began. Take us through those first couple, uh, uh, you know, instances of you, you know, being around food and, and, and learning that that was your craft and passion. Sure, sure. So I've always had a, you know, a great passion for food and cooking. Um, never realized that it was something I wanted to pursue as a profession um, until I ended up uh, transferring uh, with college. Um, I was actually taking a semester off. I was going to school for business marketing, um, and I had some free time, so I kind of dabbled into professional cooking and never really looked back. <clears throat> um, had the opportunity uh, through family to go over to Australia for a little apprenticeship for a few months. Um, came back and was really looking to see, you know, where I take this to the next level. Do I do I enroll in culinary school, um, which I did take a course through ICC, or do I jump right into the professional kitchen and apprentice? Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, you know, uh, Josh Adams at June Restaurant was doing some amazing things here in Central Illinois, supporting the local farmers, uh, making the vegetable the focus on the plate um, rather than just you know meat and potatoes, um, and you know gaining national recognition at that time with a James Beard nomination. Mm -hmm. um, so I basically walked in his kitchen and said, Hey, look, this is what I want to do for a living. Um, I want to work here. Uh, and, you know, I just kept coming in and eventually, you know, got hired as a full-time cook, ended up uh, taking over the pastry menu and worked my way into sous chef. Mm -hmm. um, and working here in Central Illinois with these local farms um, and preserving the seasons, because our seasons are so short, really instilled um, this whole idea of old-fashioned cooking techniques and, and pickling and preservation. Um, so yeah, stayed with the vegetable focused cooking. From there, I went out to Los Angeles, uh, worked for uh, one of the, the best uh, chefs in the country, in my opinion, Jeremy Fox at Rustic Canyon mm -hmm. in Santa Monica, California. Again, where uh, the farmer's market is a few blocks away and the vegetables are the focus. Yep. Um, sustainable, organic, um, creating delicious food, and it's also uh, nourishing and uh, it, it's, going, you know, it's helping our environment. Um, you know, those are equally as important um, as just a soul satisfying meal. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, I'm sure a lot of people remember in Central Illinois, June. And, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, what what uh, you, you said, you know, the vegetable based things really kind of piqued your interest. What did, what did you see in your time working there that kind of uh, molded you and, and, and inspired you and influenced you as a, as a chef? Um, really, you know, I, I would say there's a lot of modern cooking techniques, which I definitely walked away from. Um, but really making the vegetable the stars the show. Yeah, we cooked proteins. Yes, we were not vegetarian. Um, but the, the all the attention to detail going into the vegetables, um, varieties of vegetables that you don't see at your local grocery stores. You know, it wasn't just carrots and and these uh, crappy, you know, out of season tomatoes and peppers. Um, it's uh, parsnips and the root of the celery stalk and. Uh, you know, really the ultimate, uh, just really focusing on the seasons, what's in season, uh, what's at the peak of the season. Um, that is something I still carry with me there today, and I think it really started while working with Josh Adams. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, one of the things, uh, the, one of the aspects of your life as a chef is that you, do, you have your local business the, yes. the, the, with the, the breads. Um, now, I, I, you know, we, we talked about this before, how, uh, it, it, you know, bread's kind of getting a bad yes, uh, a bad name nowadays in, in recent times, and I, I almost want to call you, you're, you're almost like a bread evangelist, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're bringing the good news back to bread. But uh, well, describe um, why you think bread is getting a bad uh, bad rap these days and what you do. I think your process is fascinating with it. Yeah, so it, just, it, it ultimately just comes down to one thing. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the way we are growing our wheat and the type of wheat we are using. Mm -hmm. um, in modern day food society, you know, there really is a serious issue um, with our modern, modern food systems. Um, it starts with genetic, uh, genetically modified uh, plants. Um, we're basically, we're taking these, these uh, heirloom grains, which were the originals, and taking them in a lab, and we're cross-breeding them, and we're creating something that grows much uh, faster and stronger um, that is disease-resistant. And then we hit it with chemicals, which, again, increases its strength and disease resistance so that ultimately the farmer can make more money. Mm -hmm. um, and then we grow this wheat so that it's shelf-stable. You know, a loaf of bread on the grocery store shelf will be there for weeks and weeks. My breads don't last that long. There's no preservatives. Uh, it's ancient heirloom grains. Um, so yeah, all this gluten intolerances um, is really coming because of the type 
type where wheat we're using. Um, we're skipping the the crucial phase of phase of natural fermentation. Um, you know, what well, many people know the term sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. Well, that comes from the idea of using a sourdough starter, which is cultured uh, with natural uh, bacteria, natural enzymes that are in the air um, that allow bread to rise. Uh, it's a, you know, humans have been eating breads for thousands of years and just recently, especially in this country, all of a sudden people are, are saying, you know, bread's bad, um, don't eat gluten, gluten's a bad thing. P people don't even know what gluten is, it's a protein structure in wheat. Um, yeah. They're just, you know, somebody in the, you know, TV said don't eat gluten. Mm -hmm. um, they're not looking at why there's an issue, they're mm -hmm. just looking at, you know, ju they just hear about it. Um, so I have a lot of people that were told that they had gluten intolerances that eat my bread. Um, I've had recently people that, uh, we're told they have celiac disease and cannot eat gluten at all, cannot eat wheat, um, and they eat my bread. Mm -hmm. uh, people that are like, I was in Europe, I could eat it there, I can't eat it in America. It comes back to the fermentation process and the type of wheat. Mm -hmm. um, I use all organic uh, heirloom grains. I use a lot of local grains that are grown uh, from Spence Farms in Fairbury, Illinois. Um, they're local, they're fresh milled. I bake with it, you know, as a fresh milled flour, and all, the, the, all those things enhance the flavor without other additives. Um, they're flour, water, and salt. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to do bread because as a chef, uh, my fascination is, uh, is, is preserving, uh, is old fashioned cookery and is fermentation and bread is like the king of fermentation. Right. Right. And so, it, you know, it's a funny thing too, cause, uh, Zion, if people haven't been there or are in the dark about their food, uh, the food that they have there other than their coffee, they have a toast bar there, yes, which yes. you kind of oversee and, and, uh, and make the bread for what, what, uh, what goes into that in the toast bar? Well, I mean, kind of how that started uh, just to backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I met Mike and Banu through, uh, the farmer's market you and know, this Zion is coffee. Mike and Banu, uh, have half field. The owners, the owners, Zion, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, and uh, you know I think that's such a cool thing about the local farmers markets, is that you know you you meet other aspiring uh, people trying to change the food scenes, uh, people trying to grow better, produce uh, more quality product, um, and people like Mike and Manu is a perfect example of that. Um, they were looking for somebody to do bread. Actually, one of their uh, our joint customers that go to Zion and knew them were like, hey, they're looking for a toast guy. They're like, have you met the bread guy? He sells awesome <laughs> bread. So we met up, and, and it, it really it worked off. You know, it worked out great. Um, and it's just a really cool story going back to the farmer's market. Um, they're incredible people to work for. They wanted a toast bar. Um, so we make uh, the breads in-house at Zion for that toast bar. Um, and they're the same process that I do for my, for my small little bakery. It's a natural fermentation. Um, it's a quality organic wheat. Um, so right now we serve a sourdough, I'm a brioche, which is a French bread. That's going to have some added butter and sugar, mm -hmm. uh, some local milk, um, really nice and rich. Um, and then we do everything from like a cinnamon raisin bread to, uh, you know, right now we have a sunflower whole wheat. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's a toast bar. I mean, we have good butter, all the toppings, the jams, the jellies, the nut butters are all made in house. Avocado mash is one of our best sellers, the avocado toast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's topped with a, whatever we can preserve or whatever's in season from the local farms. I mean, it's going back to that same idea, even though it's just a toast bar, it is uh, really showcasing what is in season uh, surrounding central Illinois. Oh, awesome. So yeah. one of the other things, and this is what I, I'm, uh, there, there's a story forthcoming on this is what, and what I'm writing about is uh, the supper club that you do with uh, Zion. Now this yes. is once a month. Um, people sign up. They, they they show up. They they get uh, and they get a five course meal with some wine pairings and, yeah. and whatnot. Um, and Cody here, you you try to um, you you try to I guess present to them some of the best stuff you can find absolutely in, in the area in a very unique kind of uh, either dish or something. It's something people probably either haven't experienced or have experience in a different way. You, you always present something unique, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's our small little way. I mean, it's 12 people. It's mm -hmm. communal table. It's once a month. But it's our small little way of, of pushing the envelope towards a more sustainable food uh, culture, um, serving things that are in season, that are local, that are organic, um, and then serving some offcuts of animals. You know, if you're going to take an animal's life, I believe in utilizing all of it. You know, you, we served cow tongue at our last dinner. Mm -hmm. It's not that crazy of a thing. Other cultures uh, thrive off cow tongue. Uh, Taco de Lengua in Mexico is one one of the best selling street tacos. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, serving something like that, that people are like, oh, wow, this is a little intimidating, but there's 12 people, we're all doing it together. And they loved it. I think that was one of the most popular dishes of the night. Cool. Um, but yeah, Zion Supper Club is all about having fun. Um, we try to present a very high quality uh, product. You know, I wanted to have a, a Michelin star feel on quality of the food, um, but it, it's not stuffy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people are laughing and drinking if they choose to and, and just having a good time and eating together. Uh, I think nothing brings uh, 12 strangers together um, in a better way than a, a shared meal. Right, right. 
Yeah. And uh, what, what's your process when, you, when you're when you kind of compiling uh, the menu for a certain supper club? What where, where are you looking at? What are you trying to find? And where do you go? Yeah, I, I really, you know, I always have a couple dishes that I want to try and uh, try to present. Um, but really, I, I, I try to use what is in season, what is the best right now. Mm-hmm. So that that keeps uh, the, you know me creating the menu down to about two weeks ahead, out. Um, I can't do it a month out because I don't know what um, you know what are the carrots going to be like you know around the Zion Supper Club. What are the tomatoes like? This last one we served the end of the season tomatoes. They were still great, um, but I wouldn't be serving them next week. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know we really try to keep the concept- conceptualization down to uh, really what is in season, what is the peak of uh, uh, freshness, what is at the peak of the season. Um, but then again, we always have an idea of something that we want to serve in a fun way. Yeah. Um, the meals always start with bread. Every meal starts with great bread, and that's kind of my way of starting the meal with my vision of you know modern food issues is, is the bread mm-hmm. uh, is the forefront. Um, and we always serve house-made spread, some home, house-made cheeses, ricotta cheese, stuff like that. Um, and then we just transition into a very vegetable-forward uh, meal. Mm-hmm. Um, we say five courses. Sometimes it's even six to seven. It's kind of whatever we feel like serving. Some of the dishes are plated individually. Some are meant to share. Um, it's really meant to just create conversation between 12 strangers. Um, some of them know each other. Some of them don't. Um, and, and hopefully it's just like a dinner party um, at someone's house. Right. Yeah. And so take us through some of the dishes you made. Uh, the, the, the last, the September uh, Supper Club was held last Tuesday. Yeah. Um, take us through some of those dishes because there's, there's some really fun ones. Let's start off with the beef tongue one because you used it as a in, a in a taco format. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, you know, that was a very, that was actually, uh, I came up with that idea about the night before. I knew I was going to serve beef tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually corned or pickled, like it, so it has the flavor profile of corned beef. Um, what's in season right now that goes really good with corned beef? To me, mustards, uh, different varieties of mustards. I had some red leaf mustard, uh, pickled mustard seeds. Um, and then actually my aunt has an organic garden and had some beautiful nasturtium flowers. So I knew I was going to go pick up nasturtium flowers. That's a variety of mustard. Um, and all these flavors were going to go together very well. Well, I she ended up having these huge nasturtium petals that are still super delicious. So um, I cleaned those up and I served the the beef tongue on the petal. Um, so it was almost like the flavors of uh, you know corned beef with mustard and and I served it with a sp- uh, spiced pumpkin puree. Mm-hmm. But it was eaten as a taco, which is the most common form of eating uh, beef tongue right. probably in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a fun one. You know, people are eating with their hands. Uh, I'm taking something a little scary and I'm saying, okay, let's let's put some training wheels on this. Let's have fun. You're just eating tacos, yeah. guys. Uh, so that was a fun dish. Yeah. yeah. And it, well, and, and that's just um, now. Now I know uh, when I was there, I saw that you know you asked if people had had beef tongue and yeah. a couple people. Had, yep. but I'm sure uh, no one had had it in that format sure. with the uh, with the pedal, you know, taco. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yep. And um, now one of the other one was a uh, was a mushroom dish. W- which yes. one was that? Uh, so right now uh, in in Illinois we have our fall mushrooms. Um, actually, Central Illinois, the Midwest, is is awesome for wild mushrooms. We have our uh, famed morels in the spring. Everybody knows about those. Uh, but in the fall we have hen of the woods or maitake mushrooms, which are phenomenal. Um, they're huge. You can't miss them. Almost looks like coral, uh, and they grow at the the base, commonly at the base of uh, dying oak trees. Um, and so I found some of these, and I knew I wanted to showcase what is wild right now, these awesome mushrooms. Um, so, yeah, we did a, a really basic, uh, like, a buckwheat dumplings, local buckwheat flour, um, mixed with some house-made cheese and some uh, roasted mushrooms. I made a broth of the mushrooms, um, commonly in a dashi form, which is a Japanese broth, a little bit of seaweed. Um, but, yeah, I did some roasted garlic and, and onions in there, and it's a real simple dish of mushrooms and, and almost like an Italian-style dumpling and a Japanese broth. Um, and then we had some, you know, local greens on top, some crispy kale and uh, some fried mushrooms and a little bit of uh, crispy buckwheat for texture. Um, and yeah, that was just a really fun way of showcasing, you know, what is going on in central Illinois right now. Those <laughs> mushrooms were literally found about 20 miles away from Zion. And I was going to say, you, so you when when you go for your mushrooms, you usually forage for them. You're usually getting them yourself. Yes, right? and mm-hmm. if I'm not, uh, my family, I, I come from a, a large group of foragers. You know, my mom <laughs> is really into it, my uncle. Um, and, you know, that's just that whole thing of, like, you know, having that backbone of, you know, really inf- in, influencing me in my, in my cooking culture. You know, my family's been foraging for a long time, and now I get to showcase it um, in a more elevated cuisine. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yep. And uh, we'll pick out one other uh, dish that you served last week. Wait, um, um, just explain it a little bit as well. Sure, sure. Um, or you could pick two. Yeah. Uh, so I did a uh, 
Let me think here. So one of the dishes that we did was the end of the season tomatoes and peppers. Mm -hmm. The menu was almost like a transition from the end of summer to fall. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing that transition, even though it's 90 degrees today. Uh, <laughs> we are definitely into fall. Yeah. Um, so, you know, tomatoes were still around. It's kind of a late season on those. And we still had some really awesome peppers. Um, so I, I, I took these tomatoes and I uh, I kind of marinated them in a little olive oil and sea salt. And I served them over a house-made ricotta cheese. Um, we used Kilgis cream, which is a really great product. Again, out of Fairbury, mm -hmm. um, organic dairy product. Uh, we make our house-made cheese by basically taking buttermilk, cream, and milk and letting the curds separate naturally. And then we strain these curds and we whip the whey or the remaining liquid from making the cheese back into the cheese curds. It makes this really creamy spread. It's always on the mint toast bar at Zion. People love it. Um, so I took this cheese. I made an olive caramel, a little bit of black olives and some caramelized sugar. So it kind of sweetened, sweet and bitter um, and marinated tomatoes and peppers um, and some fresh uh, local dill flowers. Um, so it was a really kind of uh, simple, meant to be spread over toast or you know fresh baked bread um, but it just kind of showcased the end of summer with some local dairy right you know we always try to start um, I always say my first couple courses aren't necessarily salads mm -hmm. um, they are composed vegetable dishes but they're a really great spread over over bread right so it's kind of you're kind of like building up to those you know those yeah really really letting there. bread showcase you know letting bread be the focus of those first couple dishes again I'm a kind of a bread geek and mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm really proud of, of the bread I'm baking and, and where it comes from and its story uh, so I really want people to to start off with eating uh, a nice amount of bread and when we serve our bread it, it's presented on the table as people show up a lot of local charcuterie some house made charcuterie uh, we made a house made a uh, smoked salmon spread mm -hmm. um, I get some LaQuertia product which is out of Des Moines Iowa mm -hmm. really really awesome charcuterie program um, and that's that's kind of how that's that's typically how our menus do start right okay yep. and so now, now, do people, and, and I know most of these dishes at the supper club, they're, you know, they, they can be shareables or they usually are shareables. Yeah. Uh, do people ever get like, are they full by the end? Are you, are you ever encountering that? Where people, people people always say it's uh, plenty of food. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and we've kind of toyed around with it. Uh, it, it. It is the price point, you know, is a little bit higher than you're going to see in Peoria, but it's because of the quality of the product. Mm -hmm. um, also with, uh, you know, being a small operation at Zion, you know, we are bringing all this product in for this special event. Um, and, and we're really prepping hardcore for it two days out. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, we want it to be a very fulfilling experience. We don't want people to leave so bloated they can't walk out, but we want people to be very full. We don't want them to have to go grab a cheeseburger at McDonald's on the way home. That totally ruins the whole idea of these dinners. Right. Um, so, yeah, people say it's plenty of food. Um, even the first couple ones we did, I think it was too much food, mm -hmm. and now I think it's right, the right amount. Okay. Um, sometimes we'll serve more savory. Um, sometimes we end with, like, three shared desserts rather than just one plated individual dessert. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's always different. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, now, one of the other things uh, that that you do with Zion that we should let people know of, because when this podcast comes out, they'll have a chance uh, next week, is uh, First Friday. You yes. do some, and this is more uh, definitely more casual type of uh, type of food that you, you serve on uh, the first Fridays, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, what I guess, uh, what are some of the things, examples of what, what you do for that? I mean, day? first, uh, our very first first Friday was a uh, burger night. Okay. Um, house ground beef. I mean, got some really awesome uh, Slagle Farms beef and some Kilgis beef. Um, I did a little bit of uh, some local bacon, ground that in there. House made brioche bun, um, local cheese. You know, that was a huge hit. We've done everything from taco night, which was a huge hit, to a three course uh, farmer's market menu you know inspired by what is local and in, 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 in season right now mm -hmm. um, it changes all the time we actually haven't finalized what our next one will be we're having that meeting uh, this afternoon but again it's just our small little way of you know I think great food can happen anywhere mm -hmm. that's what I love about the Zion uh, Supper Club it's like you know we're serving a really good quality meal um, in a coffee shop in the warehouse district of Peoria you know why can't First Fridays happen there too and it's really a great place um, with Zion and, and Mike and Benu are awesome to work with it, for me to showcase what I want to do in this area um, you know I don't have my own restaurant. I don't have my, you know, I'm not cooking five nights a week um, for customers. Um, I would love to get to that point. But right now, you know, I, I get to bake my bread. I'm starting my own little bread company. I'm showcasing it through Zion. Mm -hmm. um, and I get to do a couple dinners, you know, a couple nights a month. Um, so we're just really trying to, to showcase and push this idea of uh, sustainable cooking and, and with at a very high quality. Right. Um, so, yeah, First Fridays are always a great turnout. It's really fun. It's very casual. Um, 
a total opposite of the supper club. Yeah. Um, now, where I, I guess for you now, you've been you, you've worked in in the food industry for a while now, and yeah. um, you've been. Around. What types of things do you dr- do you draw from for inspiration? I know you, you you're always looking for the local ingredients, yeah. but what, where do you come up with some of these dishes or some of the like inspirations? I mean, something? I you know I, I've apprenticed in a lot of restaurants while mm-hmm. I was cooking full time. Um, when I was here in Central Illinois, I was spending a lot of time going up to Chicago, down to St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I got to do that apprenticeship in Australia. When I was out in the West Coast cooking, I I did a lot of apprenticing out there on my days off um, I read a ton of cookbooks um, I'm just I'm, I'm totally surrounded in the cooking culture and the sustainable cooking culture and uh, old-fashioned cooking techniques are, are my favorite um, that's what got me into sourdough breads or naturally leavened breads um, everything from kimchi to misos I make my own sauerkrauts and pickles um, I'm, you know inspiration is, is is all around us you, you just gotta you just gotta know how to look for it mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think for me now, it's not about serving a bunch of fluff on the plate and showing all these crazy techniques. It's about showcasing the great products that our farmers grow, mm-hmm. um, the great products you can find while you're out foraging. And then me just kind of letting those products shine um, as simply as possible. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you've described this so much, and it, it definitely seems like an ethos and um, about, you know, getting sustainable food or or getting food um fresh ingredients from from local farmers that is a uh it's it's definitely a a a great choice and probably people appreciate it but it's got to be a um not a difficult one but one where you have to put in a lot of work all the time because you could just go to any kind of any old grocery store yeah um you know you do have to source it Mm -hmm. um I've been lucky to make some great contacts with some amazing farmers in the area, um, and that kind of makes it easy, um, especially working. I know that a few restaurants in the area uh, use what's an uh, operation called Down at the Farms, which Marty Travis of Spence Farms kind of created. Um, it, it's a collaboration of all these awesome organic uh, local farms, and they just say, here's what we have this week. Um, they deliver once a week, um, first come, first serve. They serve a lot of great restaurants in Chicago as well. Um, so, you know, having that at your fingertips is really great. Um, walking the farmer's market, you know, I'm there every Saturday selling bread. I try to get there early or uh, I usually sell out early. Yeah. So I get to stroll the market and be like, hey, what do you have this week? What, do, what will you have next week? Um, really, really try to stay for, away from the local grocery store. Not, not, nothing towards the the, the commercial, uh, you know, grocery stores. I mean, high V's and we have some amazing places here in Central Illinois. I mean, naturally yours is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, but really just trying to go straight to the source. Right. Yep. Okay. And uh, now, now for, for you, you've kind of got an interesting perspective on it. Now, you, you do this uh, supper club here, Midnight Espresso. They have a Sunday supper series. Um, you know, a lot of cool different food things going on in central Illinois. How much different is the food scene, the culinary scene in Peoria from, you know, say the time when you were, you know, just starting with June to yeah. now? What, what do you see? Because it, do, it does seem like there is a l- bit of an evolution going on. There is an evolution. It. And it's, and it's you know, it's happening through these, like, little weird underground dinners. Right. Um, and people starting to understand the difference. Um, and I think people are getting a little more uh, creative with their eating habits. Um, you know, the, the big thing I see with Central Illinois is that we are between two huge food cities. St. Louis is just killing it right now. They're blowing up on the food scene. Chicago is one of the greatest in the world. Um, you know, we're two hours, two and a half hours in between both of those. It'd be great to connect the dots. That's mm-hmm. ultimate sustainability. You know, the last thing that these big cities need is another, uh, you know, three Michelin star restaurant opening up. They open and they close all year long. Um, let's spread them out. You know, I love to see what's going on in Peoria. You know, I'd love to see uh, more um quality restaurants uh, sourcing straight from the local farms open in this area. Mm -hmm. And I think it's definitely heading in that direction. Um, It takes time and, you know, and and, and people have to, it takes time for them to understand it. It takes time for the local chefs and restaurateurs wanting to execute it um, because it's not as easy. Um, But I think it's really important. And it's, I mean, it is dependent on the the, the customers wanting to try this and wanting to come back and try this. And it does seem like uh, that might be more uh, of a thing nowadays. Oh, absolutely. Ultimately, you have to make money. So they have to come back. They have to eat it they have to want to enjoy it they have Mm -hmm. to want to return um and you have to be able to serve it uh you know efficiently and and make a profit off of that Um, you know it's a business so okay yeah all those things have to connect and i I think peoria is really heading in that direction yeah for sure now uh will you be at the the final uh riverfront market on saturday yes saturday and then um i will also be doing um the french market in the botanical gardens uh out at uh uh, the zoo okay um on uh the first week in 
what is that, October 7th or okay. 6th? Yep. And then what, what are other ways? I guess they could always go to Zion for your bread. Is there any other way uh, on, in the non-market on, season? Uh, so right now I'm limited to farmer's markets uh, mm-hmm. through a cottage food license. I'm working on a facility for certified wholesale. Yep. At that point, um, I look to, uh, you know, we talk about selling my product outside of Zion, uh, in the shop at Zion. Right now mm-hmm. I bake it in there. Um, yep. But if I have a certified location where I'm delivering, mm-hmm. uh, we sell it out of there. And then, uh, yeah, you know, who sees, who knows how far this will go? We'll just right. see. I'm going to keep pushing. Well, awesome. Well, yeah. yeah. So check out Cody. He's uh, you can find him at the farmers market. Yeah, Ardor on, Breads and Provisions. Yep, there we go Facebook on Saturday, page, yep. and then uh, and then if you uh, the next week, the following week, um, a week from this Friday is First Friday, yep. and then if you uh, if you did want to try out the Supper Club, there is a uh, feature on the website where you can you can register and log absolutely in every that. third Tuesday of the month. Yep, every third Tuesday of the month. Uh, well, we appreciate uh, Chef Cody being here with us absolutely. and uh, explaining his his process and all the cool things that are are happening here uh, in Central Illinois with food. So I, we appreciate it, Cody. Great. Thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm